Here we go. And we are live. At least YouTube is telling me we're live. Hopefully we're live. Chat, go ahead and come in and tell us that we're actually live, please. Um, so yeah, my name is Kent C. Dodds and I am uh, super excited to be joined by Joe Savannah. Oh shoot, I like even practiced. Um, <laughs> yeah. Savona and there Dan Ibramov. Uh, and we are going to talk about React Server Components um, because we've got, uh, I mean, there's there's a lot to talk about. It's been worked on for a really long time. And um, I've got some questions. I know a lot of other people have questions and Dan's been fielding questions like crazy on Twitter. Um, so it'd be really good to uh, just get lots of those questions answered. So uh, with all that said, let's let's just get a quick intro to who is on here. And I'll go ahead and start. So I am Kent C. Dodds. I have been working in React uh, since like 2015 and uh, loving it. And uh, been following the progress with suspense and server components and, and everything. I've been using Remix for the last two and a half years. And so uh, when server components was announced, um, I remember like when Hooks was announced, I was like super excited. When server components was announced, I was like, why am I not super crazy excited about this? And it was because I've been using Remix and I didn't feel the pains that server components are solving as, as much. Um, and so it, it's taken me a, a long time to really um, understand what uh, server components are uh, really here for. Um, but I, I feel like I have a pretty good idea of the, the use cases and I want to talk about those a little bit more. So anyway, um, currently working on uh, epicweb.dev. Uh, and so I live stream on this channel uh, constantly um, working on that. So feel free to, uh, to subscribe and, and follow me with that. Okay, Joe, why don't you give us a little intro to yourself? Sure, yeah. Um, I've been using React uh, since uh, my previous company back in uh, 2014, I guess it was, um, and uh, joined Meta uh, late, later that year. Uh, and so most of that time I've been working on Relay, which uh, probably most folks uh, haven't heard of or don't use, uh, which is fine. Um, that's okay. Uh, it's a GraphQL client for, for, uh, for React. Um, but over the last uh, couple of years, I've been working on React and uh, in particular working on server components and now uh, the uh, React Forget, which is a compiler for React. Sweet. Yeah, thank you, Joe. You've been working with React for quite a while. Dan, yeah. were you doing React back in 2014? Yes. Um, hi. So my name is Dan. Uh, but I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll also uh, introduce myself a little bit. So. I've been working with React, I think, I think from 2014. I think that's actually when I picked it up. Uh, and I've been on the React team since 2015, late 2015. Um, just mostly trying to, I guess, like uh, trying to explain what other people on the team are doing. I feel like it's not, sometimes it's hard for me to understand, and when I understand it, I'm like, oh, now I, you know, I'm going to try to to help other people understand because I think the you know, the things we're working on are really interesting. Understatement of the century, but. <laughs> yeah. Uh... yeah, very involved. Uh, awesome. Okay, so um, I just, I, I took a couple of notes. I also uh, tweeted earlier today uh, to see if anybody had some questions. So I, I've got some questions. Uh, other people have got questions. And uh, the, the live chat is going too much probably for me to see questions that show up, but if other people have questions, go ahead and try and put it in there and I'll see if I can keep track of them. Uh, but the the biggest thing, uh, or I think the most valuable thing for people watching right now would be to establish the problem that the server components are intended to solve. And uh, the way I'd like to do that is I'd like to try and explain it myself. Um, and then that way you can correct my misunderstandings. Um, so uh, back at uh, Render ATL last year, does that sound cool? Is that, that good with everybody? Or do you want to yeah. like... Okay. Sure. Yeah. So um, back at Render ATL last year, um, I met up with Vincent and he was the first person who like explained it to me in a way that I was like, oh, now I get why this is so awesome. Um, because with Remix, we're already to, uh, able to get a bunch of um, uh, code out of the client onto the server. Um, but one thing that um, um, that Projects like uh, or Meta uh, or face the Facebook uh, feed, uh, that was what Vincent was talking about. Or also like if you're using a, a CMS um, that you know, have like these blocks of components and things that um, the, the problem is that you could have a page that could have 
um, like 600 components or maybe even 5,000 components um, on that page, but they're not all going to be on that page. And they're instead going to be um, a subset of maybe 200 of those components they are going to be on the page at any given time. And so um, we want to be able to render whatever the data is with the components that it needs uh, without having to um, load all of those components, all like 5,000 or even 10,000, however big um, of a, a project that you're working on is um, with, uh, without loading all of those components. And so normally in uh, React, you'd say react.lazy, dynamic import, and that's fine. Uh, you put suspense boundaries, that's, that's great. But when we're talking about like 500 components potentially that could be on this page uh, at any given time in any combination, um, you end up with like, th that just is untenable. That would not work. Um, uh, HTTP2 and multiplexing is all cool and everything, but it's not at that level of number of requests for that number of components. So um, the, the problem is they're just a million permutations of the combinations of all these different components. And so um, the solution is like, let's just have all of the components on the server where it doesn't matter how many there are and just send their result uh, to the client, uh, the, the result of rendering those components to the client. That way you can have any number of components, it doesn't matter, and the client doesn't have to have all that code. Um, and this applies to uh, a lot of different things, um, I think, maybe not um, all projects necessarily, but um, that, that's the primary use case that I see server components being really helpful for. And then of course, there's also um, like my footer doesn't have anything dynamic in it. And it would be really awesome if I didn't have to send the code for that footer and like various other parts of the page. So that's my understanding of, of the use case for React server components. Can you correct my understanding or, or tell me what I missed? Um, I, Joe, do, yeah, do you want to take this? Uh, huh? Yeah, you can go, you can go. Yeah, I think, uh, so one, the, I believe the thing that you're describing is uh, related to the fact that uh, server components have automatic bundle splitting. So it's, uh, it's built in, in the sense that uh, you don't have to write dynamic imports. It's just that uh, if a page does not use some of the components that you want to send on the client, then we, we don't actually send them as opposed to uh, some other strategies where uh, you, know, you have like a big bundle where everything that you need uh, is there. So this is one of the optimizations that server components does, uh, but I wouldn't really describe it as the problem that server components is solving. I think it's just a nice consequence of the architecture where if we kind of have this uh, symbiotic relationship between server and client and we treat both of them as first class, uh, then actually we have all these nice things kind of falling out of that architecture. But I think like if I were to describe, um, and I think it's it's hard to describe because it's really, it's an architecture and the pitches are very different for different audiences. So like maybe use a Remix user, like, you, you know, the pitch to you would be different than a pitch to somebody because like using Create React App uh, or, or something like that. Um, but I think if, if we just talk about server components generally, um, I would zoom out completely, you know, like these optimizations are cool, but that, that's not really the point. Uh, I think uh, like w one of the ways the, uh, like I, I like to describe it is, um, you know, there's, uh, there's kind of, uh, and I think like some of that pitch also applies to Remix, but I think it's just important for people to hear, you know, the uh, kind of the overall big idea. And I think, uh, there is this distinction between um, single page apps and multi page apps. Uh, and the, the way we, you know, the way we could define them is like in a single page app, you uh, download a bunch of code uh, and then you, uh, you have like client side caches and then you kind of fire up API requests. Uh, all the navigations happen on the client side. And that's been, you know, the way we've been building whole apps with React for the past uh, maybe five years, seven years. Uh, as we moved from you know, using React for little pieces of interactivity to using React for bigger and bigger parts of your uh, app and eventually the whole app. And so the benefits of this approach, like you know, when people say, oh, like you're coming back to PHP, like what, what did you do all these years? Or something like this, I think like it's kind of missing the point. Uh, like there are good reasons to use React on the client. There are good reasons why we try to build apps this way, uh, which is like, all interactions are that don't require data are instant. Uh, you have like uh, very low latency. You can uh, 
uh, everything's very dynamic. Uh, within the mental model, if you talk about people uh, who hate SBAs, they say, you know, like, Hey, Dan, I'm so sorry hard. to interrupt. Uh, yeah. uh, Joe, is, is Dan sounding funny to you? Yeah, yeah. You're yeah your audio so. is, is not doing stellar right uh, now. Dang it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, um, I'll try to pick up. Um, yeah, so, uh, right, we we kind of, in, in, to, to some extent, it, it, like the architecture with React server components is reminiscent of, um, you know, for example, a, a PHP site with, um, you know, with, with React running on, on the client or like Rails with, you know, with like, you know, some, some mixed server and client mode. Um, but the the difference is that we're, what we're really doing is, is expanding the React model so that you can stay in one framework, one language, one paradigm, and write your app that way. Um, and so, uh, yeah, as kind of Dan was saying, like you know, if you're comparing to Remix, um, it's uh, there's a lot of similarities. But with Remix, you're still going to have um, all of the components that run on the server are going to run again on the client, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so, uh, but. Uh, and then, and then, so that's like one difference where you get um, only the actual pieces that need to be client side interactive are actually sent down to the client and become interactive. The the, the components that are just server components don't run on the client. Mm -hmm. The other piece is that um, uh, we're able to get uh, so because with with server components, each component can fetch the data that it needs. So you're kind of able to get a little more colocation of your actual data dependencies. So rather than having um, one, you know, high level uh, route handler or, or 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 loader have to fetch all the data for a particular um, for a particular uh, you know section of the page. Each server component can just get the data that that it needs or that it's gonna, it needs to pass off to uh, to client components. Um, and you know, again, like if for for um, for some apps, the, that that there might not be much of a difference there. But again, that like, but I think uh, that that can certainly um, allow you to kind of split up your data fetching a bit more. Um, and the key idea there is that if you're running on the server, then you know you 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 generally speaking have low latency access to your data, right? You're, you're much closer to, to the data center, uh, and so therefore uh, the kind of idea of like waterfalls of going back and forth to to get data uh, in each level of server components is is much less of a problem because you're just right there, uh, right you know right close to your to your data. Um, compared to something like Astro. Uh, so um, Astro, you can kind of think of like Astro components are pretty similar to server components, except that with React server components, it's it's all just still React. Uh, and then and then so so one, you get that again single single technology stack for for server and client um, that lets you then share code between server and client more easily. It also means that the the, the architecture um, with uh, with a, with a multi-page application framework. When you navigate, you're really kind of blowing away the state that you had and, and restoring state. With server components, it's not how it works. If you've got nested levels of routing, um, when you change pages, we're, we're basically using React reconciliation. So the parts of the page that didn't change, the components that like you know, the, the kind of layout of the page that didn't change, that's staying on screen, and whatever state was there is is you know is retained. And so things like um, opening up a navigation section, um, typing in a search bar, that isn't lost on navigation. Um, and so there's kind of lots of little of kind of like little details that really add up to a much more kind of cohesive experience with server components than you'd get um, with with some other frameworks. But again, like the which parts are going to be like most relevant to you kind of depend upon which which framework you're coming from. Because there's a lot of great frameworks. Like Remix is a really great framework and has a lot of great ideas. Astro is a great you know a great framework has a lot of good ideas. And so it's kind of um, some of these pieces may not resonate, but we think that the overall picture uh, is is really solid. Yeah, that, that totally makes a lot of sense. Uh, and that's, I guess, why um, the the main um, use case for React Server Components for me uh, was the reduced amount of client-side um, components uh, because uh, Remix kind of handled a lot of the other, like the data fetching and stuff. And yeah, being able to co-locate your data to components is also very cool. And and Dan has talked about this a couple of times before where it'd like, be really cool if you could have a tweet component that's on NPM that does like, you know, talks to the Twitter API and everything for you. And now you just bring it in, you render it and you don't even have to think about exactly. it. Exactly, right. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I think Dan, uh, welcome back. Um, can okay. we hear you now? Is my... 
Is my sound working? You, you sound great and you sound look great. great. Um, so okay, <laughs> so this is, yeah, this is Mac OS update. If any Apple engineers are watching it, yeah. <laughs> Fix it, I think uh, uh, Theo's in the chat and he offered to buy you a microphone. So <laughs> um, maybe take him up on that uh, later. Uh, okay, Dan, was there anything, I know you missed uh, lots of what Joe said, um, but was there anything like really specific that you wanted to make sure we don't miss about the use case of server components before we move on to talking about trade-offs and things? Yeah, I, I think Joe, I, yeah, I actually have, have no idea what Joe said, but <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing it's probably in the same vein that I was planning yeah. to say. But I think the, the big things for me is like, one is that uh, you write code in this kind of, request response model where yeah. you know you just describe what you want to see on the screen and and that works for navigations too uh which which like remix also does right so that's uh that's a pretty nice model to work in and the other part that uh, in my opinion remix doesn't really do is uh the ability to fully use uh the server and the client uh all the way down so with remix you only really have access to the server in the loaders and what you know, the, what we want to provide is the ability to use it as deep as you like, and uh, you know, depending on what what you want to do, we think you should have that ability to compose uh, server code uh, all the way down. Yeah, hundred percent. And in uh, in Remix, um, I have come up with this pattern I, I call full stack components, um, where Remix you can have a a route that is a resource route that just responds with like JSON, and then you have a component right next to it. So you do get some of that co-location, but there's manual wiring that you have to do for that to work. So it would be really cool to to not have to do that. Um, so th one of the um, the things that I'd like to talk about, uh, and Joe, you mentioned this uh, when you were talking, was the the waterfall uh, situation with uh, server components. Um, and if you are uh, shipping to the edge and your database is fast and all all of that is is good, then uh, waterfall matters less, especially since it's happening on the server. So like you do, uh, talk to the database, come back, you render some more, talk to the database, come back, render some more. And that's not a, as big of a deal when we're talking about a, you know a couple milliseconds for all of those things to happen. Um, it, I, I would say it's maybe not optimal, but it, it's fine. Like suboptimal things are great. That's why we're writing JavaScript. Like we're, we're not writing zeros and ones and that's fine. Um, so, um, that, that said, not everybody has uh, really awesome backends. Sometimes they're, they're talking to their existing data infrastructure, which is, is not stellar. Um, and so one of the concerns that I have is that it's, um, with the uh, server components that I've seen, it just seems like it's too easy to cause these waterfalls and uh, requires um, manual preloading of stuff to avoid them. Um, can you address that a little bit? Uh, I, I could maybe take this one sure. if that's all right. Um, so one thing I um, one thing I wanted to maybe clarify is that, uh, I don't think you actually want to put uh, RSV on the edge necessarily uh, because it's, uh, and I don't think you necessarily want to put Remix on the edge. I, I don't actually know how what, what you are recommending, but uh, <laughs> with, with, ser with server components, uh, like the, the way it's designed is that the, uh, the layer, like the server components layer is actually best to put closest to the database and the right. data layer. And so you could run server components on the data layer. And um, that doesn't mean that SSR uh, needs to run there. So uh, in server components uh, architecture, SSR and the uh, server components themselves are completely separate layers. So you could actually put SSR on the edge uh, closer to where the user is so that they can start streaming the initial shell as soon as possible and all that stuff. But then the server components run close to the data. So this is where the latency is low. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, uh, you can you can actually talk to the server pretty fast, because with uh, if we're talking about the edge and um, like the waterfall uh, problem, I think it's worth acknowledging that uh, you know if you write the remix loader and you put uh, two kind of awaits uh, in a sequence, you already lost uh, because uh, the the latency is between the uh, like you're not just bounded by slow data access, you're bounded by the latency between the edge uh, and the and the, like the place where the data is. 
And so uh, if you really want to run on the edge specifically, I think uh, both in Remix and with server components, you would need to be very careful so that every uh, kind of every layout, every route segment uh, needs, to, needs to do everything in a single query. Uh, and, and that's something you have to think about with, with the Remix as well. Um, the, uh, actually, the other... really quick, I just want to address that. So yeah. um, I, I think both in, in Remix and with server components, and, and maybe in, in the future, like Remix could support server components. So it's not necessarily a, um, yeah. a separate thing. But um, you can, uh, if you can push your data to the edge, then I, I think it's fine to server render on the edge. Uh, so I think that's good to establish too. And that, that's what I do um, for myself. Um, but uh, but that's a, a pretty tricky problem in itself too. Um, but uh, the other thing that uh, I, I think is uh, different from a Remix loader and having a, you know sequential awaits and a React server component in sequential awaits is that sure you can do you know promised at all run them uh, in parallel and uh, you know provided that they don't rely on each other for data, um, except the with the server component um, you. Any, any components that are rendered after that await are going to be on a next step of the waterfall. Um, and that's that's the concern that I'm talking about is I feel like it's just really easy to, to run into that. Whereas um, having your uh, data loading at route boundaries, uh, Remix is able to run all of those in parallel. It's, it's much less likely to run into that type of a problem. Yeah. Well, yeah. The... Sorry, go, go ahead. Oh uh, yeah, okay. So I was just gonna say, I mean, the the idea of like route, lo like you know, route loaders, uh, uh, you know, frameworks like Next Thirteen also have that ability to have you know uh, nested routing, right? Where you're still gonna be able to kick off the top level data fetching for each route segment and kind of get that exact mm -hmm. same ability. Um, you know, I, I think ultimately, it's it's kind of difficult. It's really ultimately just a bit too difficult to write JavaScript in a way that. Um, you like don't accidentally trigger waterfalls. Like I, I think it, it does take kind of care in any approach, right? Like you have to remember to do promise.all. You have to kind of structure your code so that you're actually like awaiting the data strictly where you need it. There, there is like a, like a certain unavoidable um, complexity there. But I think like, yeah, you're right. Like th there are some cases where RSC, like RSCs can maybe make it so that uh, like you're kind of, have to have to await the parent data before you can start to see the child fetches. Um, but there's also some, I think, some strategies to to work around that, just like, like kind of restructuring your component, uh, right? Um, and so yeah. there, there are patterns, like the same patterns as like promise at all. There's just a kind of different, slightly different patterns for handling that in RSC. Uh, mm. So it's not like a fundamental performance limitation. It's kind of just finding the right patterns there. Uh, so I, I wanted to add a few things to that. Um, so I think, um, again, like one thing that's, uh, like Joe already said it, but I do want to emphasize, route segments are fetched in parallel. There is no water, there are no waterfalls between the route segments. We heard a lot of Remix users like asking about it. It works the same way uh, as in Remix in the sense that those can be done in parallel. So any waterfall that you might have is limited to things within a single route segment. Uh, but then again, I think we're we're kind of talking about waterfalls as if uh, that is the severe problem. Uh, what's interesting is, um, well, I, th I think like as I said, yeah, if you move data to the edge as well, uh, then like you probably like a waterfall is not a problem uh, because the data access is pretty fast. Uh, the other thing is that uh, if um, so, they, they're for example, like uh, if we talk about hydrogen, so hydrogen was the first uh, React server uh, components implementation. Uh, they ended up not, uh, you know, they ended up abandoning that one and switching to Remix. Uh, although from what I heard, some people on hydrogen team are still kind of excited about React server components. Uh, so it's, uh, some of it is just the decision that, uh, you know, they were too long in alpha and Shopify needed to ship. But the, uh, the problem they like they had really uh, significant performance like they've seen significant performance problems with people using hydrogen, uh, and part of it was that it did not do the parallel data loading uh, unlike Next does, so it didn't have uh, that ability uh, for route segments. Uh, but the other thing is uh, 
at least from whatever what we've heard, uh, the problem was not in actually in the waterfalls. Uh, the problem was in uh, kind of uh, what is sometimes known as n plus one problem. Um, it, it it was that um, if you have a parent that renders a list and you have many child items, and then for example you don't don't hoist up the data loading, so you have each child item like fire off some request. Uh, and that uh, in those requests can uh, may need to fetch the same data, right? So you ask the database to like give me a list of those things, and then maybe there are some shared things in the table, but you end up going for them from each individual item. Like that is that is pretty slow, and that I think that that was the kind of things that they were seeing. And I think it's worth noting that if you convert that to a remix loader, and you parallel, you know, it's it's parallel in both cases. So you, uh, if you have like a list of React components, each of them fetches something. It's parallel. If you convert it to Remix loader, and don't forget to put promise that all there, it's also parallel. Uh, but the problem is that you did not solve the problem because you're still firing off all these requests. And what you actually need to do is to, uh, and there are two solutions, uh, like two common solutions to this problem. Uh, one solution is a data loader pattern where uh, you, you have a data layer that makes it actually uh, pretty cheap to have uh, many of those like database queries uh, because it will batch them up. So what happens is if, you, if, you're, like, if your data layer supports that, uh, you, you wrap them up and uh, it will, uh, like not to duplicate, but combine them together into a single query. Uh, and so this would fix, uh, like if you had a, if you work with a data layer like this, this would fix both uh, the problem, both with server components and with remix loaders. Uh, the, uh, so I guess like that's, that's one solution. Uh, other, uh, other thing that's worth noting is that we uh, do deduplication. So if they were requesting the same exact thing, it would actually get deduplicated. And so uh, that, that would not be as much of a problem either. Um, I think the other thing that's worth noting when we talk about waterfalls is caching. So I don't really hear uh, a lot of thoughts on caching, but uh, if we take, for example, this tweet example, where uh, you load a tweet uh, and like you're able to like, uh, you know, asynchronously have a component that, that's asynchronous and it has some data, uh, you probably don't want to hit like Twitter servers all the time, right? So uh, yeah. par part of the story with this component level uh, data fetching is that uh, for a bunch of things, they're probably cacheable, uh, like not all of them. It really depends on like what kind of, what kind of data it is and so on. But then if it's cacheable, then uh, you, you know, the next time is you just hit the cache. And so it's really only if like, if each layer of the waterfall is not cached, is slow, is not batched and so on, then th that is where it becomes a problem. And the last thing I wanted to note here is that, um, well, I think, sorry, it's just such an important topic. Like <laughs> I didn't want to address it properly. Uh, I, I'm sorry for talking so much, but- no, That's fine. Uh, I think like um, one thing that you need in both in Remix and, and in React, you know, in like Next or, or any other like server components implementation, uh, you can have waterfalls, you can have this like n plus one problem, even if it's not a waterfall, like you parallelize everything and then you, uh, you end up, you know, each of these queries, you, you fire off like 20 queries and each of them is like doing something and you're, even if you're preloading, you can, you, you basically saturate uh, the, uh, you know, the database or the service, and it's still kind of slow. Because, uh, you know, doing things in parallel doesn't mean they're actually execute, you know, like at the same time, it depends on the system capacity. Uh, and so one thing you really want is observability. So you, it's really like on the client, when we have waterfalls, uh, like do we, uh, like should we forbid people to use fetch on the client because it can have waterfalls? That's not what, like, should we force people to use, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, route-based data fetching only? Like, I don't think so. There, there are cases where it doesn't make sense. There are cases where you want to have one-off fetch somewhere deep in the tree, and it's fine for it to be lazy. Mm -hmm. But you really want to be able to see those performance problems. And so I think the, the thing that is 
that seems scary about it uh, with this move to the server and like why I think Remix is, is trying so hard to uh, like put everything to the loaders is we don't have that visibility. And what I want to see there is better tools. So what I want to see is give me the network tab for the server so that then if, if there is a waterfall, I will see it, it's fine. I'll notice it's slow. I'll notice why it's happening, I'll fix it. And it's not a RSC specific problem. Remix can also have waterfalls. Remix can also have these things. And I would want the same kind of visibility into Remix apps. So I think once we have like more tooling around that, uh, I think I think that that will also change the equation. Um, but the final, I promise this is the final one. <laughs> the, the final, the final point I want to, to make there is, uh, if you think you know, if you you can think of uh, something like Remix as a version, uh, it, it it doesn't sure it doesn't include all the optimizations that RSC does, but conceptually you can kind of think of it as it's kind of similar to RSC except you only have like loaders are the only server components that you have and then everything else uh, is is like not that uh, and you could think of like RSC uh, remix is a more restricted version where you're just not allowed to do those fetches uh, but you can also use server components this way like you can decide i'm going to have a lint rule that forbids fetching anywhere except uh, like my route handlers which are parallelized already but then the question becomes like do you really want a more restricted system? Like, do you really want to have no ability uh, to do it deep in the tree? And I think, uh, like, if you have a one-off fetch that you want to do somewhere deep, you, like your closest route handler is like many levels above maintained by a different team. Do you really have no ability to just put it there? And I think with Remix, what, what Remix users will do is they will make it a client fetch. Because if we, instead of plumping the data through like 20 layers, they'll just put it on the client. And we're saying, well, that would actually be slower. Let's allow you to put it on the server. Let's give you the primitives to do that. And then, you know, if we have better tools, I think uh, the general approach is usually more desirable. Yeah. Can I just jump in? I think um, the, I think that this is, we're kind of, the, 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 the idea here is like, co-locating data dependencies with the components that use them has a lot of benefits, right? Um, and we saw this with GraphQL and Relay, um, but th th there's you know, a, lot of, a lot that goes into using those technologies. They're not the right fit for every application. Um, and so server components are kind of taking the, one of the best ideas of like Relay and GraphQL, and, and of, which is co-locating data dependencies with components um, and just saying, well, you can just do that. Just embrace that, right? Um, and like, like Dan is saying, you're going to end up like you, you don't want to plumb data through, so you're going to end up with a client fetch um, in other solutions. Or um, what you'll end up doing is having your loader fetch a lot of data for you know all the kind of all the problems that GraphQL was kind of created to solve. You're going to end up with that because you have this restricted um, this this you know restricted pattern. And if you allow individual components to fetch their data, now oh you remove the data, or you remove the component, you don't fetch its data anymore, uh, and that's that just creates a really scalable uh, structure for writing applications. So yeah. yeah, I think it's uh, there's there's a lot of benefits to that approach, but again, it does come with with these trade offs. Uh, but we think it's we think it's a really solid pattern. I I completely agree actually that um, having um, having the power to be able to co locate your data requirement like we've been for my entire career in web we've been trying to co locate stuff like how do I get stuff to that change actually I wrote a blog post called co location and Dan is quoted in there uh, the quote is something like. Uh, things that change together should live together, like put things close together. And, and um, it's it's an, an enormously useful pattern. Um, one thing that I, I'm, uh, the, the N plus one problem is actually not something you would uh, end up having in Remix typically because you have uh, your route uh, configured, you have your URL and you're just gonna load all the data. Uh, with RSC, if you have like a little tweet and you need to go and get like all the, people who, uh, you know, responded or, or favorited that tweet or something like that. And then you render that like six times, every one of those is going to do that. Whereas if you're restricted to just the route, you're going to look at the URL and you're just going to do that once. Well, I don't um, think that's quite true. I, right? I, like, I don't think that's yeah. what I'm saying. Oh, no, we sorry, might be misunderstanding sure. each other, but yeah, correct. I mean, I mean, I, I, like ultimately um, you have some, you, there's, there's some set of API endpoints that return the structure of the data that you need, right? Um, and if there's one route, one one rest endpoint that returns a list of IDs, 
and then you need to go and make n fetches oh, to fetch right, the data right, for sure. each of those IDs. If that's the REST API like endpoint you're working with, then you're going to end up with the same number of fetches and the n plus one problem in any approach, right? It right, really right. comes down to what what at backend are you working with? Um, exactly. Right? Yeah. And then that, if that, you that. if that's not what your you know if your API looks like no, it's going to return all of those things, then of course you're not going to put that is the API you're working with. So you put it into the parent server component and you also don't mm. have this problem. So right. I do think it maps exactly one-to-one. -one. It depends on the shape of the API that you have. Right. Well, uh, what I was talking about was that this, uh, if the server component needs to make a specific fetch to go like for uh, so, some data, and then you render that same server component a bunch of times, then each one of those is going to be making a fetch. And, and that's just not no, how you do things if, in Remix. No. It's it's not true. So if uh, if if it's talking to this, like if it's getting the same, um, if it's getting the same data, so if it does the fetch to the same place, then those fetches are going to be deduplicated. So right. Yeah. So you you you've, you've solved the problem. But what I'm saying is that that isn't the way that you would structure things in a remix app. Uh, and it it actually doesn't even matter. You could do the same thing it, in the next app by just lifting things. Um, you know, it, and that's, it seems that's. It, it seems pretty important. I think we should dig into this more. Okay, okay. Can you explain this in more detail? Yeah, sure. So uh, let's say you've got a, a tweet component that first it needs to go hit the uh, the API to, to go get the, I, I don't know, let's just say it's config. Uh, okay, so every time you render this tweet component, you're going to go get this config. Without server components um, in, in a, a remix, or even if you're using Next with a nested uh, layout or uh, layout routes, um, you would do that at the um, the route layer, and so you'd only be making that request once, and you'd get the config, and then you can do all of your so you pass that as props. Uh, with server components, you're gonna it's just more natural. You want to co-locate, so you're gonna do that within the component, and every single one of those components is gonna make the request. So you've solved that problem. Like the the, the point uh, I'm uh, so making. Ju ju just to clarify that I understand you correctly. So uh, you're you're discussing a situation where we render many of those tweets, right? So it's like, yeah. and th these are different tweets. Uh, yeah. So there'd be like, and first do, we do they go, go to? So so you get config. It's like a different call per tweet, right? What what I'm suggesting is um, is a, a scenario where it's not a different call per tweet. It's going to be the same call for every tweet, and, and then yeah, like thereafter, so, we're going to make another call that's specific right. to the. Right, and so in server components, that becomes automatically deduplicated. So there would be only one actual fetch request, and then when the other server components uh, do the same fetch, uh, they will get uh, they will get the result of that fetch. It will not fire off. Done right, right. I, I, so I this we, is why I didn't think it was important to dive deeper, because all I was saying is um, with server components, this problem exists and needs to be solved. With route-based fetching, this problem doesn't exist because you would never um, make that request in the component in the first place. You do it in the load. I mean, I, I don't quite. Yeah. So, OK, what, what I think what you what you do, right, is like, again, like you've presumably got a list of tweets. Right. The natural way to write that is like you've probably got a function to like load the data for a tweet. And so you're going to iterate over the IDs, right? Like you'd have to, you'd have to, you'd have to think ahead and say, oh, like this, the tweet data function actually has like a shared piece first. So if I'm calling it multiple times, I've got to remember to like refactor that into two different fetches and call the config thing once. Like, like the natural way I think you'd end up with that in Remix is you've got a function to load the data for a tweet. You call it once per tweet in a list. Uh, with promise all wrapped around it, and now you're, you're back to the exact same problem that's happening, right? Like because you're going to want to make that function shared, right? I, I, I just yeah. I think in practice you're going to end up with the exact same pattern um, and have to do the exact same like oh let me try and lift this out or cache it, right? Uh, it just feels identical. Yeah, that well, okay, I, maybe we're thinking of a different example <laughs> or something because in my mind it's like okay I'm gonna I'm in my loader I'm gonna fetch the config. And then I've got an array of, of tweet IDs uh, that came from the search params or something. And, and so then I'll, I'll go fetch all of those and I'll just pass the config. Yeah, um, so, you yeah so you had to deduplicate it in your right. head. Yeah, you had so to like, deduplicate it. And we're doing this automatically. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's OK to move on. Because <laughs> <I, that's, laughs> in, in that's my fair. mind, um, I, it doesn't feel like I'm deduplicating it in my head. But yeah, may, maybe. <laughs> so. Um, 
for for me, it's just like getting values and passing arguments uh, or passing uh, parameters. But anyway, um, I don't think that it's uh, we we need to dive too deep into that. Um, it'd probably be better to to uh, move on to other subjects. So sure. Yeah, um, sorry. I, I, the the reason I uh, I just wanted to focus on this is to say that it has the exact same runtime characteristics. So I just wanted to say, like maybe the way we think about it is a bit different, uh, but one is not like slower than the other. This, you know, both yeah, pieces yeah, that, and, the same. Yeah, and yeah. Long especially as, yeah, it seems like they're on board. Yeah, yeah. And, and especially since the the deduping problem is solved, um, I. I personally, and actually, this is one of the the topics. So maybe this is a, a fine transition. Um, but uh, one of the things that, uh, another thing that concerns me about server components is um, overloading of standards um, and, or, or maybe not even using standards in, in some situations. So um, like overloading fetch so that you can dedupe automatically, that, that concerns me, um, I, I, it, it just does. Um, and then uh, also within a server component, being able to access things like cookies and setting things like cache headers um, how is that done in server components? Uh, I, Dan. I can try to answer yeah. part of this or yeah. Do yeah. Want to yeah, Dan, if you can go, I think you probably know more about the, the cache, uh, the headers piece, especially. Yeah. So for, uh, so can you remind the first part of the question? Uh, it was about overloading fetch. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. um, yeah, so uh, you're right. Yeah. 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 So, so one thing, uh, one thing to make it clear, like React does not uh, patch patch there. There's no plan to like patch uh, patch from the React package. Um, the plan is to provide kind of our own version uh, that works uh, with you know like the deduplication and uh, also hydration and and this kind of stuff. And providing our own version is not actually something that's unusual. You will see mm. SvelteKit doing the same. You will see Nux doing the same. It's just the most ergonomic way to, to do that kind of API. Uh, but I, that's but actually, I, 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 I'm really happy to hear that because I, I know uh, yeah, there was but, talk about overloading or uh, but, uh, yeah, patching it. And... Yeah, so I, I, but then, yeah, then, then uh, I do think that in frameworks, so like React itself is not going to patch fetch, like React is going to provide the version. Uh, but in frameworks, I think there's a question of like, uh, uh, like I think with frameworks, we would encourage them uh, to actually patch that version. Uh, but you know, it's up to the frameworks. So like if Remix, for example, if Remix was ever to adopt server components, but it thought that patch, patch and fetch, uh, you know, is is too bad, then Remix could provide like uh, underscore fetch or uh, you know, pass it, pass it into the handler and so on. It's not something that. We like React has an opinion on as an architecture. Mm -hmm. I think this is just uh, kind of a call for uh, the same as like in in just environment like uh, describe is global, but some people are like, oh, I want to import to describe because it's the you know it's like and so it's I think it's kind of an aesthetic decision on the part of framework. Um, but yeah, React itself doesn't doesn't kind of force that. It's just that we do want to have a fetch and function that that has a bunch of uh, kind of built in behaviors. Um, but so the, actually, can can I push yeah. a, a little bit further deeper on that? So if well, let's, yeah, yeah. let's say that we we do have this implementation, whether or not it uh, overrides the global fetch or, or is a utility, um, yeah. Can can we talk about the mechanism by which we um, make sure that the dedupe only happens uh, for like a given user, so we we don't end up having that be deduped across multiple users, or, or like in some cases, like maybe that's fine, but in others, it's not. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, I, th I think that largely depends on the framework. So this is uh, this at the level that React is not involved with that. Uh, but uh, the way a framework would, the, for example, with server components specifically, um, the did you pin, uh I think like by default it happens in memory. At least that's what the React version is. It's just, it's, it's kind of like use memo, but uh, it is scoped to the request. So uh, by default it, it uses uh, async uh, async, async context. Local storage. Oh yeah, yeah async it's, storage. It's like, it's, yeah, it got, it's, it's like not, the name got been, changed to async context. Yeah. It's named very confusingly because it has nothing to do with local storage in right, the browser. Right. It's just like a similar. Um, but I, I think it's been renamed to async context, uh, but it's just a feature of runtime environments like Node and I think like other environments support it. 
uh, that lets you have uh, kind of things that are scoped to async functions and all the async functions called from them. And so that is, that is kind of you naturally get this uh, async scope for for the request, and that's how you ensure they're not like shared between users, is because it's per request. So if you have a render like ten tweets uh, in a request, but they all fetch the same config, it's going to be duplicated. Uh, but from what I understand, uh, frameworks uh, like Next.js and any other frameworks, uh, they uh, can also add some kind of options to fetch uh, that are you know, not uh, like I think like a cache key or something like this. Uh, but essentially that would allow like you to opt in saying, you know, like this part, uh, you know, this data is actually really static uh, or and, like I want to share it between users. Uh, I want to like share it uh, on the edge. Like I want to keep it on the edge so that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't even do a fetch at all, like next time uh, or even do it during the build. So that's another thing that server components can do is uh, you can run them during the build. All of this stuff runs the, during the build. It produces uh, the output that's not just HTML, but also the uh, kind of server components payload so that if you do SSG, so server-side you know, static generation, the server components, uh, you, you, know, you get the HTML pages, but you also get these like payloads that let you navigate between them without losing state. Uh, and so that that like the data for this can also be uh, you know also be cached if you specify a special thing in the fetch. Mm -hmm. So uh, does that answer? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I actually want to dig a little deeper on the last thing you said. So what is the mechanism uh, from the the developer standpoint? Um, how do I control the dedupe uh, uh, features? I guess. Yeah, so I think uh, the level of control, and again, this really depends on the framework. Like, Super Components has no opinion on this. Uh, I believe the way this works in Next is you uh, pass an option like cache, uh, like either no cache or force cache. Like, there's a few different options uh, that specify whether it's basically uh, cached per request or it's cached uh, during the build time, so like forever. Uh, or if it's maybe always making, I, I I think like, I don't actually know if always making a new request is an option. I think it it probably always deduplicates by default. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just some kind of an option you pass. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you, uh, frameworks that support incremental revalidation. So again, I think Next supports that. For those frameworks, uh, I think you should be able to say that you, you want it to be fetched, pretty, uh, sorry, cached pretty hard, but then there is an API you can call from your mutation handler, for example, uh, that says revalidate this thing. So that, that would like clear uh, that from the cache. But I'm, I'm not an expert on this part because it's really not Next.js specific. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, awesome. So the second part of my question, I think has to do with that uh, where where did we land? Is it async context or async storage? Async context. A async, okay. context. Yeah. async context. Yeah. So I, yeah. I think the async context is the answer to, to that second part of the question. So accessing things like cookies and setting things like cache headers from a server component, how does that work? Yeah, so this are uh, this, uh, other example of kind of context, uh, like request specific things, right? So they're they're kind of global. Uh, but they're also scoped through the request, so you don't want to leak it between requests. So this is also framework specific. It's not really part of server components uh, like spec. So in Next.js, you import uh, cookies from next slash something, maybe next slash header or something like this. Um, and I think like your concern as well, this doesn't, you know, this, this doesn't seem like a standard way to do this. Like I think by the standard, you probably mean that you want to have the request object uh, yeah. from Node.js or another, uh, I want, or maybe uh, at least In my loaders today, I, I get the request object. And if I need to learn, okay, how do I get the form data out of this request object? I go, go to N MDN uh, to learn about how to do that. Right, right. But then like, for example, for cookies, you have to parse them. So you probably copy and paste, a, you know, a piece of sure, code yeah. that but the fact is that them. I'm, I'm working and, with the request object and, and that is valuable to me. Right, so I think like if you were, uh, well, I, I mean, I, I can describe what I understand to be why Next decided to do it this way, but um, the, the thing is like, 
there is a, there are a bunch of things that you want you know you want to be able to parse cookies you want to get like headers in a way that's like easy to iterate and so on and so you either copy and paste those pieces or you probably write your own helpers like get get parsed cookies from response and that is essentially what Next.js cookies is, uh, except like this this function is they just wrote it for you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I and don't then mind the difference like is... using utility functions. I guess my question to take it back a little bit is just how do I access the request and response objects? Yeah, yeah. I, I was just getting to that. So uh, the uh, I don't I don't actually know exactly how how it works in Remix. So my my knowledge is pretty limited. Uh, my understanding there is just that. Again, like speaking, why you know why why next to this way? I think it's because, well, you uh, you can start at any layer, right? Like in because server components don't confine you to loaders. Like you can actually do it anywhere. And so, like the component that cares about cookies might actually be deeper in the tree. And right. so, if Next.js gave you like a response object, and then you would like thread it through like every prop, like twenty levels down, you probably don't yeah. want that. So you probably want to read it from the async context. And so now there is just a difference. Okay, should the async context give you the request object and you just call a function on it, or should you just have a function that gets it from there? And I think that's how they landed on, well, in the component, I just want to call cookies. I don't want to call get response and then call cookies on that. Uh, but I think if you were building, just get into your question, right? Like if you were building a, uh, like if a Remix was added in React Server Component support, and Remix felt that it's really important to have access to the underlying request object, then I think uh, Remix could export uh, get request function that ideally you can call anywhere in the tree, like otherwise you would have to plump it down. So ideally you'd be able to just get request it, that would be scoped to, uh, to, the, uh, to the current request and then uh, you could, you know, call your utility function. So mm -hmm. I think it's pretty much the same except like, Next, just tries to skip some extra steps that so that you don't have to do the plumbing. Yeah, and and that's fine. Uh, it, I'm satisfied knowing that I will have a way to to get the request object itself that started this asynchronous, you know, rendering of all these. Yeah, sort of I, I mean, if, if you're developing the framework, you probably have that, so you can pass it in. Uh, you mm -hmm. can expose it. Yeah. Yeah. Super. Uh, so that's that's good for the request side. So on the response side. Um, Let's say that I, I make a, a request to some API and that API, it's a fetch call. And so that fetch response has cache headers that I want to make sure are forwarded along for my document request. Because uh, like my document should be cached just as long as the data that fed into that document, right? So how do I uh, in, and again, this might just be like, you know, it all just is up to the frameworks. Um, but uh, in in a because I'm making the fetch call in a server component, I need to get those cache headers into the response that uh, that server component's going to be rendering. How would I do that? Yeah, I I don't actually I feel like I don't actually have a good answer to this because I'm not super familiar with the problem. Um, I think I'm a bit confused how you would have enough knowledge. Uh, at that level to decide for the entire document because right yeah the, actually the, right, there's uh, like multiple I, fetches right yeah so in, in I, I don't know how things work in uh, Next.js but in Remix the the loaders are all going to be called um, before we start um, rendered a pipeable stream um, and so by that point we can set cache headers and whatever else we want to on the response once that first uh, byte has been sent that's too late uh, like so. Maybe this is um, uh, this will be a little bit different, but because we're calling the loaders first, um, we can get the uh, we can make the fetch calls. We can get what those headers are, and then set that on the response before we start the stream. Uh, this is different if we use defer. If we're using defer, then you know we've already sent the response. We can't set those headers, so uh, that would be a different thing. But um, it, if my understanding is correct, the, the default behavior for a server component is once you await, it's going to go to the suspense boundary and, and we're streaming now. And so it'd be too late uh, to wait for those uh, fetch uh, headers to come back. Um, Dan, you're, you're making this confused look. And so I'm not sure I'm probably like, explaining it wrong. Well, I, I think... No, no, no. no. It's, just, it's just hard for me to process. So I'm, I'm trying to keep it all in my head. It's yeah. Like, it's cool. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, so I I'm sorry for the face. Oh, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> I think this does go back to the same answer, which is like, 
it, it's a bit how you set it up, right? Like you could choose to wait for all the server components uh, to render um, and then start like flush that down, right? But that doesn't lead to necessarily the greatest user experience because now you're like, you have content that you could be streaming to the user and you're holding back to see if there was any like, any fetch that needed to update the response object. And so again, like, like, like as you mentioned with, if you're using defer in Remix, then you lose that ability, right? Um, and it's I think it's basically that the default behavior in Next um, and like what we kind of recommend as a default behavior is that you use streaming, where literally every server component is kind of have is kind of implicitly uh, like a, a a remix deferred loader, right? Or, and so that that just kind of happens by default. Um, but it isn't to say that you couldn't create a framework that had a different default uh, to to kind of give the developer some extra flexibility there. Sure. I, I think uh, can I, uh, to go ahead, Dan. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just want to try to see if I understood what, what you were saying. I think there is, so, so one thing I do want to clarify about how, um, how streaming works is that it, it, for us, it's not that everything works as differ. Um, uh, it's, it's more like that. Uh, Suspense boundaries. Cert- yeah, so in server components model, it's you kind of have the shell. It's like the shell of your app, kind of the outer part is the part uh, that's above all suspense boundaries. It like doesn't include them. And so we actually do buffer that, right? So we don't, uh, we, I think like if you suspend in the shell, so like if you fetch something uh, above any suspense boundaries, uh, we we wait for that. Uh, because that lets, like in some cases, you might want to decide to send like 404 or something like this. And so as long as you do this above when any suspense boundaries or in Next.js uh, app router, it's called like loading.js. Um, as long as you do it above, I think you, like we should be able to set any header, like a framework should be able to set any headers that it wants. Uh, I think the part that doesn't quite, uh, I, like I, I, I can't quite understand this, you're saying that your loader that does a fetch reads some headers from that fetch, and then you want to forward those headers to like the document uh, response. But this is, I don't understand how this could work because if you have a nested, several nested route, route segments, each of them does a different fetch. Cool, Remix waits for them all, that, that's fine. Uh, but how can each separate route, like, okay, one of those fetches has one, cache header returned, another of those fetches has another cache header returned. So how can, if, if your loader says, uh, I'm gonna send, I'm gonna set these fields on response, I'm gonna forward, then it, they're gonna clash because different fetches have different headers. So you need a system that coordinates them. And for example, says, if, if even one of those fetches that fired uh, ha- cannot be cached, then the entire thing cannot be cached. So you need a coordination layer, and that's what I think maybe Next.js does by default, but I actually don't know. But mm-hmm. I'm just questioning the premise that it's possible to write composable code where each loader decides what to do for the entire page because it just doesn't have enough information. Yeah, sure. I, I So I can address that first. The So the way that it works in Remix is um, for... Uh, for each loader, uh, okay, so let's first talk about client transition. So when you make a client transition, you're calling all loaders from the browser, like multiple fetch requests happening at once. So each one of those responses will have its own headers and whatever else, and that's fine. Uh, for the document request, though, you're right, like you only get one, you, you're going to call all of those loaders, but only one of them gets to be the winner. And, and so as far as the document request goes, and uh, some sometimes not always but sometimes you want the the data headers on a client transition to be different from the doc, document headers as far as caching is concerned as well and so uh, remix has a export on a route that's just the headers for a document request for this um, route and so the the lowest child um, headers export is the one that wins and it has access to all of the headers that were returned from all of the parent loaders or yeah, all the loaders uh, for the page. So that's how it accomplishes uh, the task. But anyway, the, I think that the core of my question is, uh, we talked about um, how to get stuff out of the request in a server component. And my core question is, how do I get stuff into the response uh, of a uh, from a, a server component? And I think the answer is, in a server components world, we focus on streaming as like the default. And so most of the time, this isn't a concern because 
you wouldn't be able to put anything into the headers or res the response anyway, because it's too late. The response has already been sent. Is that right? I, I don't think that is the, I don't think that is the main issue. It's really um, like in server components, you really think in the components uh, paradigm. And so response and the, the response is the global thing. And so it's, uh, like, I feel like maybe, you know, this sounds to me like something that the framework should do based on, you know, what what the fetch, because like it already instruments fetch. So it already knows what the headers uh, are. So why why do you need to write this code that combines them automatically and tries to decide, you know, what the right thing is if the framework already has this information and it can send uh, set the request, uh, sorry, the response headers. But I'm also thinking like, if you were making it more kind of pluggable and customizable, uh, then I think you could, you know, you could design an, a server components framework that would do this. It just sounds like a di different layer to me. I think that's that's what I'm getting at, uh, because we also don't have a concept of uh, kind of um, we don't have concept of client fetches uh, hidden different loaders, so like in client navigations. Uh, because we, we don't have loaders, right? Like we only have one RSC endpoint. Uh, we can tell it to produce a smaller part of the app. So we can tell it, okay, like I'm, I'm just gonna need uh, the contents of this tab. Like I don't, I don't need the entire page, but because the endpoint is, is the same, it sounds like, you know, this is the part that like controls it, which is the framework is the part uh, that decides on the headers and so on. And I guess like maybe you could have some kind of middleware or something to cook into it. Uh, but it, it just sounds like a different layer to me that's like maybe a bit higher level or like closer to this uh, boundary between like network and the component system. Uh, but, but I think it, sh it, should, it should probably be doable. I just don't know enough about uh, how it's actually like how it works in XJS. Uh, mm. But it's a, the, I think like the, the underlying, you know, the underlying thing that you want to get out of this is caching, right? Like that is really the point is like being able to say, you know, this stuff, doesn't change, uh, and I think the like if if we think about it from that perspective, I think it's also important that uh, with with server components architecture, um, you can also like cache cache the output itself, right? So uh, you um, it's it's not just about caching the like from the uh, client point of view where it hits oh this RSC endpoint uh, you know it, it has the same uh, it hasn't changed, so I'm, I'm just going to reuse uh, the cached one. But you can actually like not have to, uh, even if it hits from a new client, uh, that it, you don't have to like execute the uh, server code again, uh, because uh, the uh, like in cases where everything is cacheable, like you only have static data, uh, you can cache the actual server components output completely, um, and that is not just for initial load; it's also for navigations because we hit the uh, server components endpoint for navigations uh, and, and not the loaders themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, I think, um, so we, we scheduled to, to do this for an hour. We've been going for an hour. Our, I, I still have things that I would like to talk about, but I want to respect your time. Um, are you okay if we keep going or do you want to, to wrap things up? I can go for a bit more. I don't have anything. Yeah. Okay, great. Because okay. I, I want to I wanna talk about the um, the learning aspect of this, uh, cause the, it is a pretty, uh, different mental model. Uh, and, and one, uh, sort of related thing to that is the ergonomics. Um, I personally, um, really like making my components as large as reasonable. Um, and with the introduction of hooks and then, um, suspense boundaries and error boundaries, and then, uh, now server components, uh, React is slowly making me break my components down to smaller and smaller pieces. Um, I don't really know what to say about that, but I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts around breaking down components that far. Uh, and actually, not just components, but now with server components, we're breaking them into multiple files now too. You can't even have the, you know multiple components in a single file. Well, I mean, you can't, but like you know, different worlds of components in the same file. So let, yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think, well, the, 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 on, on the, the file piece, um, you know, that there's been a lot of discussion around like 
can you like can you can you ship just like one character of the file down to the client but like the second character of the identifier stays on the server uh people are trying to get really clever about like just how fine grained they can get uh pretty soon there'll be a framework that's like literally like shipping individual like pixels of a character <laughs> uh you know um but uh like ultimately this comes back to like trade offs like every every like uh, point on that spectrum has trade-offs, um, and and I and I you know I think like it it is valid to to try to like to allow you know uh, client and server code to be interleaved within a like that is a totally valid strategy to to allow that level of interleaving. We've found that the like the mod you know file granularity is a pretty good trade-off. Um, it just makes it a lot harder to like shoot yourself in the foot with uh, including like you know a, a secret that was intended for the server and like you know shipped out to the, to the client. Um, it, it just helps developers not make dumb mistakes. Um, I'm like, we're, we're human, right? Like we, we all make silly mistakes. Um, and so having, having, having a default that kind of pushes you, pushes you in like the right direction we think is, is good. And like, again, it's not a fundamental limitation, um, of, of the framework. It's kind of a, like, this is how it's kind of, well, let's, let's kind of make this the, the, the default, um, mm. We could, so we that, could, that, that's that again, we could, in the theory, meta framework later. decision then, uh, that's a, not a react server components limitation that these have to be in separate files and things that, that comes down to the meta framework. I mean, I think, well, that, that part comes down to more like the bundler integration. Right. Um, but, uh, like you could, like you could write a bundler that let you, uh, like that, let you put server and client in like in the same file and like the bundler splits it up for you, but it makes it a lot easier for the bundler if it's going on a per file basis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so there's, there's like bundler considerations, there's like developer experience considerations. Dan's probably going to correct me and say, actually, there's like more to it than that. I'm sure there is. <laughs> um, but like overall, we think like, we, we think it's, we think it's a good trade-off for like at least those reasons. And, and Dan can maybe add more. Um, look like you want to jump I, in. I, I want to contradict just a little bit. Like I, I would say that- Go for it. Um, because, because like, I think it's fair to say this is a limitation of server components in the sense that uh, like, next, you know, it's not like a Next.js decision, for example, to have like use client uh, directive or the server client split by files is our decision. And, uh, but this decision is not fundamental to the architecture. So, you know, if we really believed that it's better to put this stuff in one file, uh, we could do that. Like, we, but that's actually what we started with. Are the, you know, like like Joe mentioned, we've been working on this for a while uh, before like uh, any Next.js 13 stuff or before Remix existed. Um, and uh, the initial version actually had collocated uh, like a load function. At, basically, it was very similar to loaders, although we, we haven't seen loaders back then. Uh, and we uh, decided not to do that because we we, we actually felt like uh, the boundary is a bit too fuzzy. It's too hard to make it work with TypeScript in the way that we want it. Because again, the, the problem we were solving is composition all the way down, not just on the route level. So it's it's a different kind of uh, it's a different kind of boundary um, because you need to be able to render those things as well. And so uh, we kind of for now we decided that the file split is. Uh, you know, the least annoying thing, yeah, like the least food gunny thing, but I totally understand that it is annoying. Like it is annoying me too. I think like sometimes maybe people, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, I think like it's fair to say it's annoying and we still think it's it's worth it. <laughs> I and, you know that uh, actually, that's good enough for me to know that um, I'm not the only one who's annoyed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I wanted to, I, I think like there's, there's a few interesting nuances there. Like one is that um, you like RSC is really not prescriptive about how you structure your app. Like uh, you could you could imagine uh, uh, it's like components. You know, like components components don't tell you how to structure your app. Everybody's asking asking right. like what what is the file structure <laughs> that I should use, right? So it, it's a little bit similar in that uh, you can imagine Remix style RSC approach where you just have like RSC close to the top level of your route, like maybe one or two RSC, you know, server components. And then everything below is like use client. And so only like your, it's, it's like loaders, except they're a bit more composable. And, but then like everything below is just your normal React. And one thing I want to emphasize, this use client thing that you see, you're not supposed to put it into every file that, that uses client features. Uh, but, we need to document this properly, but it's really, it's the split point. It is the entry point from the server into the client world. And then anything you import from that 
it's just normal React. So it's mm -hmm. it's really kind of like it marks where the serialization boundary is. It's mar it marks where the props become JSON, um, and where the bundle spinning happens. And so, um, like one way you could use it again is like you only do this uh, at the top. You have a few RSCs at the top, and then uh, at the top of route segments, but the rest is client. And then you don't really have that problem as much because most of the time you're like in client React world. Uh, but of course, that's not our vision. It's like it's more like remix vision. Uh, but you know, it's it's like a that that is a thing um, that that you might prefer. Um, but I think if we talk about the full vision, um, we're in a bit of an awkward phase where we're just used to you know writing stuff every time on the client, and then we don't really have ergonomic ways uh, to add client server connections aside from writing client JavaScript. And that is actually one place where like, I think Remix is ahead uh, in the sense that like you have this really nice progressive enhancement story with like forms and uh, you know the uh, handlers and so on. And one thing we would like to have and like, that we're working on with server components uh, is uh, mutations. So with, with mutations, the idea is that you would be able to um, pass a function uh, from the server to the client uh, that, that like does something, for example, create a to-do or like delete a to-do. And so um, then the, the boundaries kind of start, you know, like currently when you're in server files, sure, you can talk to the database, but you're kind of limited in the interactivity because, well, you can't have event handlers. So every time you want to add an event handler, you're like, oh no, like I have to refactor this button to be like the proper component. I have to, you know, I have to like, read something from the context there to like make some kind of update and it, it just seems like a lot of effort uh but i think what what we're kind of where we want to get is first you would just have a lot of those client components like kind of from the beginning because it was structured this way where uh you you like you said yeah you abstract a bit more you create those pieces a bit more but then uh, you kind of use them in more places uh, but the other thing that I think is really important here is you would be able to pass functions from the server. So for a bunch of things, like before you layer any client, before you add any client files, you can actually get to a working application, right? Because you can have like uh, a button and you pass it to like the server action as, as a prop, except that that crosses the network boundary, but it's like automatically integrated with it. So you, you kind of don't have to add it for every interaction. You only have to add it for interactions that are like client specific that only like need to update some state and not just like call something on the server. And then if you need to update some state, you probably already have state. So you're probably already inside a client component. And so you're actually not extracting anything. You can just use, you know, button and click directly. So I think it's like, there's some adjustment of where we're, you know, of where we're going to get. And uh, until we have this like, features like mutations, it's going to be more limited and more clunky. But I think as we move towards this world where uh, it's easier to kind of be more expressive across bo both boundaries, I think some of those pain points may melt away or at least not be as noticeable. Yeah, yeah, yeah think, it's, it's annoying. Yeah, I think we'll, like, we'll structure apps a bit differently, right? Like with kind of like, uh, as we were kind of, as we were looking at some of our first product integrations, we're kind of seeing that, um, Right now, you often like uh, you want to you want to uh, write a log, right? Um, some in some component, and so okay, now that that thing has to become a client component because it needs to use have a use effect. But okay, like most none really up to the only reason this this entire component has to be switched to client is because it needs to like write a log somewhere. Uh, like, how can we restructure so that we can just make that a behavior that's passed in, and then everything else like kind of passed down somewhere else. Right, like to, and then, uh, and then, just like now, that that component can stay as a server component. And then, if you can pass that 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 like that logging effect down somehow, then actually most of its children can become server components too. Uh, and you realize that a lot of a lot of the app can actually be uh, server components. So I think we're still kind of figuring out some of the patterns there to make that even easier. Uh, but I, I think that a few years down the line when server components have like, you know, taken over the world and, or, you know, and we're all like writing educational content about how to structure them. I think we'll, we'll, it'll be, it'll look, the apps that we, that we create will look a bit different than what we have now. And, you know, we'll have like, just like we did with hooks and, and other like, you know, new things in React, 
the community will kind of figure out and iterate on different like approaches to that. But I, I, I do think we'll see like different types of a different like way to structure apps uh, over, over emerge over time. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I think that it uh, it can be dangerous to conflate um, uh, a good idea with familiarity or lack thereof. Um, and so I I'm not uh, opposed to saying, hey, we're we're just going to structure things differently. That's that's fine. Um, the, and uh, to your point on mutations, Dan, uh, I remember before Remix had mutations, uh, Ryan built the Remix website and it had, at the time Remix was paid, now it's open source, but uh, so there was like, we had to, or Ryan had to build this uh, site to take payments and use Firebase and stuff. And when he was done, he was like, I didn't use like any of the cool things from Remix. I just like, cause, cause Remix didn't have mutations yet. And, and so much of the things that we're building today are uh, re require mutations. So uh, I can definitely uh, empathize with like, you know, it'll be so much cooler when we get that that half of the story done um, and, and make a lot more sense. So anyway, um, yeah, I, and I think that uh, uh, hopefully when once we solidify the patterns of uh, how do we keep server components, server components, and how do we think about like pushing the client components over here so we can keep that that bone structure we can talk about that metaphor here a little bit um but uh once we solidify those patterns and then people are educating on that then it just becomes the way that you do it and and people wouldn't think of doing it any other way um to to me right now um uh, that is still um unclear uh what what that structure looks like um right now all i see is i've got the server component and now product just asked me, hey, we need to like, this is our footer. So like, I, I figured that's a server component easy. And then they say, hey, we want to have like that language picker needs to be a special uh, drop down or something like that. And oh, shoot, now I need state. Um, and so like, eventually I'm hydrating everything on the page. I'm not using any server components. Um, but to your point, I do think that um, it's not that server components isn't capable of um, handling that sort of structure. It's just our minds need to change a little bit on how uh, we structure things so we can keep those server components. Uh, and I don't think we need to to dive very deep today into like how you might accomplish that from a technical perspective. Um, just that it that sort of thing should be possible. We just need to discover what those what those things are. Well, one thing, yeah, totally. One thing to add is, it's just that that doesn't mean that you like can't use server components at all. I just, it just means that I think in the like today, right? Like there, are, there are places where like that footer will, that footer will be mostly uh, all you know server components, and then the like that like the the language picker will be a client component, and then maybe in the future we'll we'll like there like some we'll be able to say actually there's just like a generic. Uh, I mean, ultimately, if you need some interactivity, that's always going to be a client component. But um, things that like might have needed like a bit more state around them, maybe we'll be able to pick, like have uh, components that allow you to kind of push that down a bit more. Um, but certainly, like today, that even like that example, right? Like you'll still be able to have most of that static content be written as a server component and get that benefit today. So um, mm -hmm. we're, we're already like well on the way uh, to like the I think achieving it's it's a, it's a more of like. And a further up level of optimization, I think, where uh, that will that will see going forward. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and and then in the context of like lifting state, now we're like lifting client, I guess, uh, when we are are talking about interactivity, where it's like, well, this this little thing had its own state management, and but now like its sibling over here needs to manage that. Like we can still keep. Uh, the siblings between those two uh, can still be server components. We're we're just kind of structuring things in such a way to enable that. Um, and I, I think actually now is a, a fine time for uh, Dan. If you want to talk about your your bone and muscle metaphor, I think that actually helps a lot. Or at least it helped me uh, thinking about where server components fits. And um, especially in the context of like, I just kept thinking we're going to have to hydrate everything eventually. Like everything's going to need to have some sort of interactivity at some point. Um, but the bone and muscle idea kind of helped me um, change my mind on that. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand the part about hydrating. Like I think you're, maybe, maybe you're, you know, like we can talk about server components as an optimization and put it, you know, like, oh, you don't have to hydrate, meaning like you don't have to run client, a bunch of code on the client just to match, you know, to connect to the server, uh, server like HTML as you traditionally would and like as you do in Remix apps, because well, there's 
if you, there are pieces with no event handlers, it's kind of pointless, right? Like, why did we connect to this DOM if there's nothing that it does? Um, so it's, you know, it's, a, it's an optimization, but I think maybe we've made the mistake, like in talking about server components so much from like an optimization point of view, because then uh, people started saying like, oh, like, but you can do this, this thing differently, or you can like optimize this in this other way. And I think it's, it's really more about the, uh, kind of the overall paradigm. And if you think from like the, uh, the, the, the way, uh, I think the other reason it's confusing is like currently our mental model of like here's a React app you just you just think of like entirely client tree which can be server rendered but it's it's still a client kind of centric tree and so there's a question of like if you know when I look at the site or like in an app I'm like I can see the tree in my head right like I'll be like oh easy this header footer like sidebar blah 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 but I don't have that exact intuition yet for how I would split it across server and client world. So I think I think that is like okay, like how deep does the server go? Like, is mm. this like these three areas that a server, or like how, what what granularity is there? And I think that we're still figuring it out. We, we don't know, and th there are different styles of using it. Um, but the the one metaphor that like I found really helpful, uh, which is you know the one that you were talking about, is that so server components are kind of like a skeleton. So uh, in the sense that uh, you know like. You have, you have the skeleton, you have this like kind of wireframe, very uh, kind of very coarse thing that just like has like, you have a footer, a header, uh, main bar, like feed, it has posts. But beyond that level, like it, it doesn't, it doesn't really, uh, you know, it doesn't have to go all the way. And then like, maybe you say, oh, this, you know, the post, like it needs to have a, a uh, for example, like add comment uh, or like like button that, uh, that that needs to be a client, and so you put it there, and then you're like, oh, actually, like this uh, this whole piece, uh, it should be tabbed. So like there should be multiple tabs, and in this case, uh, if you're not familiar with server components, you might think, well, if this thing has tabs, so like if this thing is a client component, I have to convert everything below it, and that is not true. So that, that's, that's the mind-bending thing that you have to learn with server components is now for client pieces, you kind of have to think of them as having holes. So, uh, and that is usually good, even if you write client-only code, like you have an article about this uh, called uh, the, the biggest React mistake uh, or something like this. Uh, but yeah, it's one of my more clickbaity article titles. I, I should change it. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good article, uh, yeah. But it, I'll, I'll it's link about to it in the idea. comments for folks. Yeah, it's about this idea that uh, it's actually, and it solves, uh, it solves some performance problems. It solves props pl pl uh, plumbing when you have to like pass props to like 10 layers. Uh, it's kind of this idea that sometimes the interactive parts, so for example, the tab, uh, you know, if you have like multiple tabs and you have like a switcher between tabs and you have the content, and like the way you could implement, one way you could implement this uh, you render, you have like a switch statement. They say, if this like a tab is this, render settings tab. If this thing is this, render like uh, something else tab. And you do this from the tab view component. But the other way to do it, which I think is better, uh, is, is kind of where the interactive part like has a hole and it's the parent component that specifies what goes into that hole. And so that way uh, you kind of have this like islands of interactivity, but they're not, like they're donuts of interactivity. And that is how you think of server components. It's like you have the server component structure first that may, uh, with mutations, you can even make it fully functional, right? Like you can be like, click an add post actually as a post because you pass the function from the server, it does a refresh automatically. Like click an add comment actually as the comment because it's just HTML forms with like progressive enhancement added by React, right? But then like sometimes like in like like button can actually be a server component because it just passed the uh, like action to it uh, and, and, and it just works. But then are like, oh, I really want an animation here or I really want this just to have this nice, you know, extra client stuff. And so you kind of add the client stuff around, like you add a donut of interactivity uh, or you kind of, another way, like, you know, if you think of the server component structure, the skeleton, you kind of add in meat around the skeleton in the places where you really want client-side client side specific behavior. Uh, and then 
I think that also gives some intuition for why you can't uh, render, uh, you can't import a server component from a client one. Uh, it's kind of like all server components are connected to each other as, as a tree structure. Like you can't have a server component live somewhere in the ocean. Like it has to be connected to the, uh, to the structure. That's what them run, that's what lets them run first without, uh, you know, client server waterfalls. Like they, they just run all on the server and then on the client, client bits I filled in during a SAR and then like on the client. Uh, and, and that's like, you have this skeleton, you add this kind of pieces of interactivity and you decide like how deep the skeleton goes. And so with, with Remix Paradigm, the skeleton is just the loaders, but you can go like deeper. And, and that, is, uh, that is the part that seems pretty exciting, but we don't know how to do it yet. Like the pitches come, fig, you know, come with us to figure it out. It's, it's interesting. It's, it's a really interesting way to build apps, I think. I think, yeah, that metaphor helps a lot for me too. Um, the so to make sure I understand the um, the goal of a an app that wants to leverage server components is to keep the server components going as deep into the tree as possible. Um, and whenever there's a, a piece of interactivity uh, that's needed, make a client component that um, accepts slots for lack of a better term, children or or even multiple layout uh, or, or yeah slots. Um, that can further the depth of the server components um, in in that uh, context. Is that right? Yeah, but I think it's it's also important. Like, I don't think there is one goal, right? It's just uh, this is the direction that seems really interesting to explore. That that kind of fully unfolds the potential. But the, we can't really get there before we have uh, mutations fully, right? Because then it's just too much plump and you need the client stuff way too often. Um, but I, I, I think that is the eventual goal. But it is, you know, you also don't have to do it right now, right? Like the, the way you can do it now is like stick, you know, stick to a kind of just like maybe you have like 10 server components in the entire app that is just, uh, you can think of them as, remember the presentation on container components pattern? Yep. <laughs> like it's kind of a little bit like this, uh, uh -huh. except there's like actual difference in that, you know, there is a technological difference and what, you know, some of them can really take advantage of the server and then some of them do what the client does. Uh, but even then, you know, even if it goes deep, I think there are um, uh, like, it doesn't mean that client is bad. I think like maybe uh, some of our messages like doesn't, like we're really excited about the server part because it's new and because the client part, we've mostly figured out, right? Like we we think React is pretty good. I know, yeah, like use memo, like all of this stuff, pretty annoying, like we're working on it. We're like, Joe might have, you know, if he, maybe he can ask Joe a little bit about the compiler stuff. Uh, but uh, we mostly think the model is, is good there. And now we're, okay, can we extend this model? Can we like, can we do this, but for the server too, and like let you publish components on NPM that have server actions, for example, so that you can compose these things together and they're not like confined to loaders or routes, but just really composable the way React is composable. Uh, and so I think th there are these things that you can like adjust uh, and sometimes client is better. So to give you an example, um, uh, so, I was uh, I was playing with uh, some server component stuff like in my free time a few months ago uh, uh, when you know when like next just uh, just came out with the first version that they supported and I was working on uh, like I was playing with a code highlighter so I was working on a code highlighter component that currently like it bundles uh, the parser for like all the languages we support uh, even you know even if the page doesn't have so, so you, you were I remember you were talking about like you know, like what if you have six hundred components you only need some of them but the problem is actually like it occurs in small scale it's just I want to render a code highlighter uh, why am I shipping like all like ten languages for MDX page that only shows like two of them or something like this um, and like why is it not automatic um, and so I was my first instinct was okay I'm gonna convert it to super component. Uh, the parser is going to be on the server. The highlighting launch is going to be on the server. Uh, the client is just like going to get uh, the kind of final rendered output. That's going to be fast, right? And that is better from the you know 
bundle perspective because uh, we we load less code on the client. Um, uh, even even though we actually load, we have to load this parser anyway, like on another page. But at least like on this page, maybe we don't have to. Uh, but I've noticed like on a really long page, uh, the overhead is just not worth it uh, because it just generates so much HTML. Uh, the HTML itself is gets really bloated because like all the codes, the highlighter, like it inserts spans with class names around every token. So it's actually pretty bloated and like, uh, maybe it's just better to load the parser on the client and do this on the client. And then I realized, oh, wait, uh, I get, what I can actually do is I can split it in two. So I can, my code, you know, code render, whatever code highlighter component, uh, can be a server component that renders a client component. And so on the server part, I do the parsing, uh, but then instead of generating HTML, which is pretty bloated, uh, I just, uh, generate the. So, so, so I kind of like have my own encoding for uh, the, just the semantic tokens. information, like the tokens, yes. And like, I, I just write it in a lot more efficient way uh, than, than HTML would let me do. So I just write that, you know, like as a string or like as a JSON object, and I pass it down to my client component, which receives this JSON. And that is a thing that is like, oh, I'm going to iterate over that and produce, uh, you know, produce a React element. And so, the, but the thing is like, I was able to do all of this without changing the API of my components. So my consumers don't even need to know that this happened. So it's really this ability to like pick the trade-off very granularly on the component level between this is what I want to do on the server or during the build, as in my case, it's actually during the build. This is what I want to do like on the client. And I can, and this is like the things that I'm passing through and then you can adjust them as the time goes. I think that's, that's really what like, I feel like, wow, I, I really could not do that before. Um, so that's, that's pretty powerful. Yeah, that, that is powerful. So, uh, to be clear on, on my website, um, I don't ship the parser to the client, but I do ship the, that bloated HTML it's MDX code, but yeah, ends up being the same thing. So that is, that is cool. Um, that, that level of composability. Um, I think that, um, the, um, uh, one thing that I'm taking away from this conversation, I think it's probably time for us to wrap up to, um, is, um, like the the main benefit of server components um, is not in um, performance optimization necessarily. Those are like natural things that fall out of this. the The main benefit is co-location um, and uh, composability, uh, bringing composability to the server. Uh, am I missing something, or is that like the core offering of server components? Uh, I think that's yeah. It's just so many things, uh, but I think yeah, it's. That's definitely uh, a big part of me, it. Yeah. yeah, Jojo, maybe you, you, you can take this one. Yeah, I feel like that's definitely a big part of it. Yeah, like I, I mean, right? Like, ever, I think for again, like for for different people, they're going to like kind of latch onto different pieces of it. But I do think that's a really big piece. It's extending the component, the React component model to the server, and a lot of other things kind of fall out from that and from the specific design. But um, being able to just write in a single technology, a single language, a single framework, a single set of idioms across client and server, like that's the big. That's the big thing. Awesome. And I, I would add that with uh, like the other cool thing about this example that, that I just gave you with the code highlighter is uh, so I, I was able to, you know, like I was able to hoist this, like you could say, okay, I can just hoist it to like a remix loader and do process in there and then plump it down to, like every code example on the page and somehow have them figure out which one the data is for. But then like on another page, maybe I want to do a dynamic, uh, like an actual sandbox where you can edit stuff, right? And so uh, then I would have to do it differently or I would have to like, uh, you know, do like make another component that has the parser. But the cool thing here is like, if I didn't use any server only features, I can run that on the client too. So I can put that code, the code highlighter that on the page where all examples are static, the parsing happened on the server, I had my custom format, and so on, and then you know it's it doesn't it doesn't ship that. But then when I go to the page that has a sandbox, I use the same component, but this time I render it from the client component because I need to pass the state because the user is typing, I need to update as the user is typing. And and so uh, in in this example, that same code it gets bundled, you know, it runs on the client. Uh, I didn't need to write any more code. And then because of these like optimizations we talked about, like automatic code splitting, actually that code 
is only there if you visit that page and actually render that view. For example, if you visit like some other, uh, you know, I, I don't know, if you have like a different role and you don't see, like we don't show it uh, based on the data, uh, if that component doesn't end up in the tree, we also don't send a script for it. So that, that, that's like the optimization that, that they talked about. Uh, but it's really that like once we give full compatibility to the server, the client tree, give them equal power, give you the ability to kind of combine, intertwine them and like entangle them together, componentize it, put it on NPM, they can do mutations, all of that stuff. It's just that these all these optimizations just fall out of that naturally. And I think we're like part of the reason we are kind of nerding out over this. Because like for end users, yeah, you just you just use it. But I think for us, like part of the excitement is well, we didn't expect that so many things would just fall out of it. It's, it's just uh, like once you see it, it's like, wow, this this is something special. Awesome. Hey, thank you both uh, so much for giving me some of your time and everybody else who's watching. Uh, so yeah, a round of applause for uh, Dan and Joe. Um, it, uh, as we wrap up, is there anything that uh, you want to direct people to uh, to, to learn more about server components um, or uh, yeah, follow what uh, what you all are working on right now? It's the best place. Well, you're the one working on the docs. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, I was going to say the new docs site is a pretty good place to start. Um, that's, it, uh, it doesn't have server components yet, though. It has it has just like a tiny link, uh, a, a tiny section. But um, that's it's a, it's a it's a it's an okay jumping off point. Um, there's the I original it, like presentation that we gave. Uh, so um, that was actually uh, so Lauren Tan. Uh, it was like Dan, you uh, you and uh, Dan and, and Lauren gave the original presentation. Um, uh, so that's like worth uh, worth checking out. I think that's still kind of good. It's like a really good introduction if you're so if you're kind of still unfamiliar. That's a good place to start. Uh, we've evolved things a bit since then, but it still gives a really good uh, kind of conceptual model for how to think about it. So that's definitely a good starting off starting point. Yeah, I, I would say from my side. Um, I would definitely recommend, uh, because I feel like in discussions uh, we've had recently, I kind of have, uh, and I, I get it, like it's it's a 40 minute video or, or like even more. So I kind of get the sense that maybe some of the things we said there are already forgotten or like faded from memory and also understandable. But I think like I would recommend to maybe watch it. We, we do, like Lauren and I kind of talk about different stuff there. Um, we do have a demo from that video. Again, it's a little outdated, so uh, uh, but you can you should be able to run it as is. It's just the conventions have changed a little bit. Um, I I think like realistically, I would recommend to uh, check out Next.js 13 app router uh, as the most comprehensive implementation of server components. Uh, so it's you know this is the closest thing that um, be, because. It, we actually, so for people who want to kind of dig into the internals a little bit, uh, you can go to the React repo uh, slash fixtures slash flight. So this is not, you know, general developer friendly, but if you want to poke into like what's the minimal setup that kind of works, uh, th there is one there, uh, but it's using a Webpack plugin that uh, is more like a, you know, uh, kind of a reference, like a toy implementation. And that is part of the problem right now. Is like if you want to try them, you uh, like React server components depend on the bundler integration to really like deliver all, on all these features. And realistically, like Next is the most advanced one because they actually like they invested into building a team that builds a bundler. So that bundler already supports them. But we we've seen interest from other bundlers. So we're working with uh, uh, the bun bundler, the parcel bundler. Uh, and we're open to working with any bundler developer uh, to, to kind of lend this feature as a first class feature because we think it's bigger than React. Honestly, we think it's uh, like it's something that, you know, if, if, <laughs> if other people recognize the promise there, I think uh, we'll see it in other, in other libraries and frameworks too. So we'd like that to be a first class feature. And so, uh, but until then, I think like, Fixture slash flight that that shows like minimal wiring that you can, uh, if you're like kind of an advanced user, you want to play with it, uh, check that out. But if you're more like an application or like a, a developer, I would say Next.js 13 app router is is the place to ch to check how it's intended to be used in practice yeah. because it has all the other pieces. So like it has routing, it has like invalidation, 
So you're just not going to get stuck uh, because plain RSC would only let you like refetch the entire tree. And then the router is what allows this parallel loading and, and like all, all the other common cases. Um, but uh, one, one, I, I do want to clarify, um, we, sorry, uh, we, of course, we do want to document it on the React side. So uh, the re I think like there is a clear separation in terms of uh, what are, for example, like Next.js or Gatsby. Gatsby also has preview support of server components. I just haven't tried it myself, so I can't, uh, I can't exactly say, uh, you know, how kind of mature it is at this point, uh, but maybe that's something you can try to. Um, but uh, the, the, like there is a clear separation. And um, if you're like on the more kind of technical side, I would encourage you to check out the RFC that uh, Joe wrote. So the original server components RFC is merged in uh, React.js slash RFCs repo. Uh, you can check it out. It describes pretty detailed, like how they actually work under the hood and like what are the benefits that, that we want to get from them and so on. So I think that that's also good reading. Uh, but the plan is to upstream the React specific parts into React dom documentation. And we just need to figure out like what's the most cohesive way to do this that doesn't make them seem like some weird, you know, extra feature, uh, but also doesn't feel alienating like client only users. And that, you know, threads the balance between like, you try, you can try it in frameworks, but like, how do we explain it without the framework? So these are the things that we're thinking about. And this is top of our minds after uh, the documentation for all the current stuff uh, ships. So we'll definitely be figuring it out. But in the meantime, those are the resources that, that are probably best. Oh, that's all very helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, so as, as we just wrap up, um, thank you again, both of you, for uh, giving some of your time today. And hopefully this was instructful to, uh, for other people. Uh, the future has a lot to tell us, uh, and it's an, an exciting one. So thank you uh, for all your work on this. Uh, definitely looking forward to uh, that doc site getting uh, shipped, uh, published officially, and then we can get some server component stocks on there too. That'd be sweet. So thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for hosting. Yeah, it was, it was fun. Okay. Thanks everybody. We'll see you all later.